Hello, this is Miss Dagan Ford, and I wanted to introduce you to our next chapter and unit, which is on classification. And we're going to sneak in chapter 12 on this as well. So to start with, here is our uh, new digital notebook. And I had a little fun with our pictures this time. And you can, <clears throat> you can uh, add these stickers however you like uh, and have a little fun with them. And so uh, I'm going to put my little African uh, painted dog down here. Um, and so uh, what we're going to start with is the tree of life. And the tree of life uh, and how we classify animals, the tree of life is showing you kind of our current way of classifying it. And so how do we get to this spot? And so that is going to be our learning goals for today. We're going to be able to identify the levels of classification taxa we are going to be able to describe uh, the common characteristics and features that are used to group organisms, the different kingdoms. We're going to uh, describe the roles of using scientific binomial nomenclature, and we're going to be able to explain the hierarchy in the classification uh, taxa. Uh, now, this is an updatable slide, so as I go, I'll be adding more learning goals to this. Uh, so the bell ringer was about the pangolin, and so um, you were asked to determine <coughs> what characteristics uh, would be helpful to know about the pangolin and what you thought the pangolin was. So you're going to watch a couple of videos that just explain uh, this little uh, uh, cute little critter and the different types of pangolins and what they're facing. A good example of why uh, Christian environmental stewardship is very important, understanding the value of protecting uh, these uh, animals. Uh, but the pangolin is a mammal, uh, and as a mammal, it does have fur, it produces milk, it carries live young, uh, or at least this type of mammal does, and uh, provides milk for its young, and so that defines it as mammal. But that does bring up part of the confusion of classification. It does have scales, but these scales are not the same kind as the scales on lizards, and so that's very important. The more we investigate, the more we realize the differences. So you'll watch these videos, see what they're like. All right, uh, now, uh, how did we start this little journey into classification goes back to the 1700s with a gentleman naturalist called Carolus Linnaeus that actually wasn't his, the name that he was born with. He actually renamed himself when he was developing his classification uh, model. And so he, he just decided, you know what? I like this name better. So he was born in 1706 or seven. Um, I've heard conflicting reports about that. Uh, he is uh, Swedish and he was a naturalist. He loved nature. He loved going out and uh, collecting specimens. He went on expeditions to collect uh, plant specimens especially. But one of the things he was frustrated about was how organisms were named. It was very frustrating if you're speaking to somebody who is coming from a different country and they have a different name for the organism. Now he wasn't begrudging them the fact that they named it something different, but what was frustrating him was the communication. And so every scientist would seem to have its own way to classify tomatoes uh, and call and say what a tomato was. Uh, thus the joke about the, the meme down there, you say tomato, uh, you say tomato, uh, I say Solanum lycopersicum, and that is the scientific name of tomatoes. And so his claim to fame is that he sat down and developed a system of classifying organisms, both by their morphology or their shape, uh, and also by the means that they reproduce. And that ended up being much more uh, clever than he realized. He didn't understand the significance of that, but he chose that. And then he created the two naming system. And so you will be watching a couple of videos on him. Now, uh, what he developed was the system of taxonomy uh, that used a hierarchy of levels. And these hierarchy of levels ended up um, 
nesting within each other. And the organisms are grouped by common characteristics. Uh, reproductive structures are another one. And then of course now DNA, RNA, uh, sometimes by a protein structure. Uh, so of course now we have modern uh, day techniques. So the organisms are placed in these taxa based on these characteristics. Now we've included a new one called domain, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, tomorrow, but domain is now above uh, kingdom. So uh, kingdom, notice in this diagram, what kingdom does um, is going to nest. All of these blue boxes are referring to the phyla. And so in this kingdom, there are one, two, three, four, five phyla. And they're pulling out this box, the phyla of vertebrates. And so in this phyla of vertebrates or chordata, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight classes. And so if you pull out one of these purple boxes, classes, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, orders. And that's going to be in the pink, the order. And notice how they're nesting within this. So this blue box, the phyla, also contains all the classes, orders, families, genus, and species in that phyla. And in that phyla, that phyla contains class, order, family, genus, species within that little, uh, uh, the class, and then so forth and so on. And so notice that means they're going to get more and more specific the further down we go until we get to species, which means we're talking about just one type of organism, in this case, um, a leopard, Panthera hardis. And so uh, the further down you go, it gets more specific and more narrow with its categories. And then the, the farther up you go in the uh, hierarchy, the more general and more enveloping that group is. So for instance, in order to be considered an animal, you really only need to be multicellular and heterotrophic. And that will put you in the category of an animal. But if you are going to be in the genus Panthera, you need to have certain characteristics of that genus, of that family, of that order, of that class, of that phylum in that kingdom. And so the list of what characteristics you must have gets bigger. Now you should know, uh, that's one of our goals. You should know that hierarchy and you should know, uh, the order. And so to that end, there are some really handy dandy, um, uh, mnemonics for knowing this. So for instance, kings play chess on fat green stools, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Now in the last 15 years, uh, 20 years, actually now we've included domain. So now, uh, like I learned it as kings play chess on fat green stools. Now we just need to in include domain. Do kings play chess on fat green stools? And that would be, uh, now the new, uh, mnemonic that you can use to help you remember. So, um, one of your questions would simply be, list them in order and you just need to remember do kings play chess on fat green stools and then you'll be able to know okay king of kingdom play is phylum chess is class and so forth and so on so this is just another way to illustrate this so notice the pink circle in the animal kingdom encompasses all of these animals so all the way down to worms and jellyfish they're all animals but notice the purple circles would be the phyla. So each one of these, so notice there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten phyla in the animal kingdom. Now within the phyla, there are different classes. So the mollusk phyla have one, two, three classes in the blue. The invertebrate classes uh, in the uh, arthropod phyla we would have one, two, three, at least three classes uh, in the um, arthropod phyla. Now you'll notice that we have these subphyla and subfamily. You don't need to know about those. I'm going to show you the logic and the uh, rules of classifying, and that's going to be sufficient. So you need to understand how these diagrams work, but you don't necessarily have to memorize any of these diagrams. I would let you know if you do. So notice all of these classes 
fall under the vertebrate phyla. And then uh, we could pick out the mammal and of the mammal, you would have several orders of mammals. You would have several orders of reptiles and they nest within that. Uh, here's yet again, another diagram that kind of illustrates this. This time it's going from the kingdom on the bottom, but notice you can pull out all of these nesting categories. And that's what we mean about a hierarchy. Each taxon level gets nested within the category above it. Uh, so here we are, the question time where you had, this is a picture that was on your homework as well. So notice how many animals are in here. We've got spiders and a sea anemone, a jellyfish that looks like a clam. And then we've got our bird, sparrow and butterfly and bat. And then as we go down, it starts eliminating animals because they don't fall under the characteristic. So all mammals need to have fur uh, at some point in their life, produce milk, carry live young. And notice under class mammalia, if you go above it, that means in chordate, um, as we go from chordate to mammal, we're losing the fish, we're losing the shark. They are vertebrates, but they're not mammals. And so we start eliminating, get more and more narrow. We could make another diagram that went from chordates to reptiles. And of course I pick one that does not have our, oh no, there's the crocodile. And so we would then go down to the class reptilia, the order crocodilian and so forth and so on. So uh, take some time, pause and answer the questions, talk about it in class. And then when we come back, we'll talk about the binomial nomenclature.